Uh, yeah, and then uh, it's up to me to announce my own presentation uh, on behalf of many others. As you can see, uh, I might be a bit of a strange person here being an engineer working with models. So I was really interested uh, in who of you are working with numerical models. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Five hands. Well, I, I hope this talk, uh, I've got two aims, to tell you a bit about the science, but the other aim is also to tell you a bit about the benefits of modeling, uh, also linked to the, the theme of this conference, uh, turning science into practice, what is it? Uh, to, to make sure it's used. Um, and I think modeling is an excellent way of, uh, of doing that. Um, and I want to illustrate it by, uh, by showing you a project we did uh, in, uh, in Adelaide, the Adelaide Coastal Waters, which you see here. Uh, I think most of the people uh, roughly know where Adelaide is. Um, the problem we, or basically our client, the South Australia Water Corporation, had in, uh, in that area was there's a lot of seagrass loss. Um, and they sort of got blamed for it. That's the short story. Um, and why did they get blamed? Well, they have a, a lot of uh, wastewater treatment plants, or actually they have three. And those wastewater treatment plants put a lot of nutrients in the water and a lot of suspended sediments. And you all know what usually happens to seagrass then. Uh, it dies. And it was a huge seagrass uh, sea die back in uh, the, the last part of the, the, the previous century. Uh, there's also been a lot of research into it. Um, you see how many hectares got lost. It's a substantial area. So it was a substantial problem. Uh, lots of studies. And it turned out, yeah, it's due to the nutrients and epiphytes. Um, so they need to be reduced substantially. As, and such a substantial reduction means also a substantial investment. Um, and these numbers you see here, like the 75% and the 50% are sort of come from an expert judgment. Uh, and we know, yeah, it's hard to make an expert judgment, especially if you can't really quantify what is driving the system. Um, so as I was thinking, yeah, we do like to improve this environment. It's our, it's our own backyard, our children are playing on the beach. We all realize the problem, but we really want to spend our money well. So they came up with this approach. They want to do, figure out what's really happening in the system and then start working on things that really matter to spend their money, uh, basically uh, money, society's money well. Uh, and to do that, they started, well, how do we get better grip on what's happening in the system? Uh, they called us, or uh, they called a consultant like us. Uh, and they said, well, we want, to get a bit of, uh, we want to get a better quantitative understanding of how the system works and want to have evidence for these targets, not just 75 or 50 percent. We want to know how much we, re we really need to do to get uh, a better seagrass system and where to target our investments. Should we do it in the north? Should we do it in the south? Uh, and is our wastewater really to blame? Because there is a lot of other stressors in the system. There's river drainage, irrigation, uh, shipping, other factories. Um, and they also wanted to know, okay, how should we monitor what's really going on? So they want to have a basically a focused planning of their investments. So we said, okay, we can model this area for you, put a lot of in there. So we combined data uh, from historical uh, sources, from remote sensing, from bigger models. Um, and we ran a simulation for a year, a sort of representative year. So all con conditions happening in a year were basically in there. Uh, and another important requirement of SA Water was, yeah, we should be able to discuss things with our stakeholders using that model. So it shouldn't be a black box. It should be a transparent box. Uh, so they wanted open source software uh, and something they can be able to work with themselves. So they really understand what they're telling other people. So we started working then on the development uh, of the Adelaide Receiving Environment Model yeah. called ADEM. Um, and basically, well, this is a, a probably a very familiar slide or type of slide to most of you. It, it all boils down to habitat suitability modeling in the end. There's a lot of that before it, a lot of uh, engineering stuff with partial differential equations, but I'll stick to the habitat suitability modeling here. Um, we based habitat suitability on uh, seven, seven conditions like substrate, wave conditions, 
salinity, temperature, inundation time, flow velocity, and of course, light. Uh, we put it all in, in models, and we got some uh, habitat suitability models for every individual factor for all the nine species of seagrass over there in that steady area. So we've got a really a good idea of, ah, okay, this is the factor that's limiting seagrass occurrence there, and this is the factor that's limiting seagrass occurrence over there. So there was al already a fairly good step. Um, and this was phase one of the project. And we decided in phase one, we sort of tried to keep it simple, uh, learn from that, and then we're going to talk with everyone involved, people who know the system really well, and they can say whether we did a de decent job modeling or that we have to improve some things. So it turned out at the end of phase one, uh, we already found out that discharges are responsible, that was the starting point. It's not only discharges, uh, but we do have a limited insight in other processes, like what's happening in the water. Uh, what about resuspension, for example? There was a process that didn't get much attention before. Um, what about other stuff in the water, like sedum, for example? And what about the epiphytes? Uh, so, phase one identified a lot of unknowns, data gaps and knowledge gaps. Uh, and one of those was, for example, what, what time, what light do we really need to, to look at? Uh, we first, we started off with the amount of light reaching the seagrass in the, in the left panel. You see this zone here, and this is where the people of Adelaide go swimming. So they realize, well, this is where most of the seagrass is lost. Typically, people don't go in the deeper parts, very deep parts. Um, and that didn't really show up in our modeling. We said, there's still sufficient light for seagrass to grow. So we realized we needed to add processes to get it basically to make sure it's darker over there, which we did in phase two. And now you see, oh, there's not much light for the seagrass to grow. So it's suffering over there, which matches reality. Um, I also mentioned sedum that turned out to be uh, an important factor as well. And not only the sedum resulting from SA waters discharges, but also basically the background values. So what's in the environment anyway, what comes from, from mangroves, which are also uh, growing there, from the seagrass itself and from other sediments like uh, runoff that's happening anyway. Uh, the same basically applies to uh, suspended solids. So again, in the left panel, you see the suspended solids resulting from those wastewater treatment plants. And in the right panel, you see what's happening if we include that resuspension. Again, you, show, you see this dark red band of higher, or much higher sediment concentrations due to resuspension. So that was really an important process. Um, so at the end of phase two, we covered most of the data gaps and knowledge gaps and could come up with a, a much better understanding of the system and also a much better quantification of where seagrass would grow and where it wouldn't grow depending on what you would do with those wastewater treatment plants but also with other uh, scenarios. So the model helped to identify those gaps and uh, address them. Um, and of course, you want to know, well, yeah, yeah, your model, you're talking about the model, it's still a bit black box. How well does it work? Uh, we think it worked fairly well. Um, so in 70%, 72% of the area, uh, we did quite a good job where we predicted habitat suitability and where we actually found seagrass. Uh, the orange area, 22%, uh, we have a false positive. Uh, and only 6%, we have a false negative. So uh, we didn't predict seagrass, but it's growing there anyway. Um, and then your second question what might be, yeah, what does SA Water actually have to do to meet those targets or better to get that seagrass back? Um, this picture is a slightly more complicated one because we're running scenarios and comparing uh, one scenario to our base scenario. So the colors uh, show you the improvement of that scenario over the baseline, and the baseline is the 2011 situation. Um, and uh, the, the scenario that we compare is the current situation, or 2015 uh, situation. And something important that happened in that period, in 2013, was the closing of a big potash factory that put a lot of suspended sediments in that area anyway. And what immediately becomes apparent is 
this big area of improvements, uh, and this is the area where most of the seagrass uh, had died, uh, just by closing that, that, that factory where SA Water didn't have anything to do with, we already got a huge improvement. Um, so the, the next question is obviously, yeah, if, you, if SA Water does those big improvements on the wastewater treatment plants, reducing the nutrients, reducing suspended solids, uh, what more are we going to get? And that's what you see in the right picture. Yeah, you see some extra patches of increased suitability as well, but not much. So, yeah, you can ask, well, is, is this worth the effort or can we s spend our money in better ways by locally restoring sea grasses on locations that are indicated as suitable, but where it hasn't come back yet? Maybe because there's no sea grass at the moment uh, preventing local resuspension, for example. So this gives you uh, nice pictures for discussion, your management options, uh, and spending your money. Um, so what we learned, well, we, seagrass recovery is a slow process. Uh, in conditions already improved, but we didn't see the result in the field yet. And the good thing, I can tell you about it now, that places where we re predicted seagrass recovery are actually showing recovery. Uh, that's this, uh, this fresh news that just uh, came in last week. Um, about the modeling, this two-stage approach, like we start simple, identify knowledge gaps, and improve the model with things that really matter, uh, work really well. Um, so it showed us more about system understanding, but it also uh, got people used to, uh, to modeling. Um, and the nice thing, well, I'm a modeler, and I hope to transmit this message to you. Uh, you can ask a model like this multiple questions that help you understand it and inform your investments or your, this was for a commercial client, so it's investments, and for you, it's your science questions, basically. Um, another benefit of this one is that, uh, well, we made it for, for SA Water, but actually because there's so many processes in the whole environment in there, you could study other uh, things you, you like to know about that area as well related to seagrass or to uh, uh, other processes in the, in the Gulf of St. Vincent. Um, and yeah, we thought by discussing pictures like this and the approach we take, uh, it's a good way of involving managers uh, and other stakeholders in what you're doing uh, and not having a, a black box but it, it's really, it provides a way of talking to each other and by, by bridging that gap between science and society, basically. So, well, um, thank you for your attention. Um, and it's also to me to ask if you have any questions. They're welcome. Questions? As one of the external reviewers of the process, um, I'm pretty familiar with what's inside the model, but, and I'm really pleased to see some of the things that we recommended being enacted. That's really exciting. But um, your false positive area, your, your orange on your map, do you have any insights into why that's coming up? Um, it's a <laughs> a good question and um, I have to think about that I think there are multiple causes for it um, and it's been a while that I've been working on this project personally so I can't give you the answer on top of my head uh, I, I can look in the report what was the cause for it and I think the causes for that differ per region a bit um, maybe also I can add to that just for uh, yeah well, having been involved <laughs> in this study I think uh, part of it uh, explains that uh, not all seagrass maps are 100% accurate either. So the model has its level of uh, inaccuracy, but the mapping also has its inaccuracy. And the second explanation could be that there are areas where there still is seagrass, but the environmental conditions are uh, worsening, and we might expect to see the seagrass slowly disappearing from some of those areas. Okay, thank you, uh, Paul. <laughs> Other questions? 
So you have um, y you compared your expectation of where seagrass would be with um, so you made a model and you compared where it was present. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that was only presence absence or also any differentiation in species and how that would match up or did match up. Um, if I remember correctly, we didn't. We only check presence absence because uh, that's what the, the, the whole seagrass map is mainly about. Uh, there are quite a lot of mixed meadows in there, I think. Um, and it's, the project was not really about restoring all the different species. Uh, it's more restoring uh, the area, basically. So our main interest was in reproducing the area. Yeah. OK. Um, you started your, your talk with saying that the Water Authority uh, was well, potentially willing to do something they wanted to have a better insight where to put their money. Uh, I think one of the big uh, problems resolved just by itself was the closing of the factory. Um, could you give us any idea of how it helped the Water Authority in terms of putting their money? Uh, actually, did they, um, how do you say? At, at the start, somebody said, 75% per percent reduction, 50% uh, reduction in this and in that. How much money was involved or uh, saved? <laughs> uh, nice question. Um, I don't have insight in, in how they spend their money eventually, and I'm not sure if that decision process has come to a full end yet. Um, what I do know is uh, well, they have three wastewater treatment plants. Um, and they wanted to know, well, if we're going to reduce uh, affluence, where would it be most effective? And they find out, yeah, the, the most southern one already had its improvement plans. And if you would do anything there, it would be very costly with very little effect. So they decided, well, we're gonna, not going to touch that one. Uh, we probably see more uh, value for money if we address the two northern ones. And the affluence of those uh, affect each other because uh, that, that's by the mixing in the bay. Um, so I think the, the most northern, uh, I think the, the most uh, value per money is what you get when you restore the middle one, which is called Glen Uh And the most, uh, no, that, that's the middle one, but uh, the overall biggest reduction in affluence is achievable with the northern one, be simply because that's the biggest. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you, you live there, so... Uh. <laughs> um, they're trying to decide whether to put in a, I don't know what it is, half a billion dollars worth of new treatment plant at that northern site at the moment. So the scale and the type of treatment plant they are considering is being informed by this model. So it could save a lot of money, but it also could save a lot of habitat and it could also help restore, if we improve the water quality enough to along that coastline there, um, it could restore up to 5,000 hectares of seagrass. So, so these are very, very valid trade-offs they're trying to make at the moment. And, um, and I think this kind of evidence is helping them make the right choice as opposed to a, oh, we don't have half a billion dollars to spend. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, the latest update on the situation here. Um, thereby, uh, if there are no further questions, I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, session. Uh, so let's thank all our speakers uh, again and hope to see you tomorrow.